All right. Hi there. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming today. So we have a fantastic panel with us today. We have Kate and Sam, who are both with Foundation Presents. You might be familiar with some of their venues downtown, being The Social in Beecham. And then we have Brian here, who is an inductee in Hall of Fame 10. You can clap for that. Very good, and he has um, he has a long list here of so many things that he's done from from production manager, director, um, with working with Blake Shelton, the CMT Awards, Sir Paul McCartney, um, Neil Diamond, Brad Paisley, WrestleMania, and several more, several others. But that's a that's a nice listing there. So we're going to get started um, right away. So first off, I'd like to ask um, Kate and Sam talking about the um, Foundation Presents and the Social and the Beach. And can you tell us, for those of us who aren't fam uh, familiar with the venues, a little bit about the venues, the differences, um, maybe similarities, types of um, you know, artists um, you know, that are really most um, fitted and suited for your venues? Sure. Uh, hello, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, so if you haven't been to our venues, we have two venues in downtown Orlando called the Beecham and the Social. One is a 1300 cap room and our smaller venue is uh, the Social 425. So we do, we also do some outside shows because um, we're a promoter company that hosts uh, our shows in house. Whereas sometimes rooms will have a different promoter come in and do shows in, in their rooms. So we're nice because everything's in house. Um, so, oh, Lord, sorry. <laughs> um, I forgot what I was saying. No, uh, so a little bit about the similarities and maybe complete differences between oh, yeah. your venues. Um, so, I mean, the biggest difference is the scale, basically. So both of our stages are on the smaller side. The Beecham is a 100-year-old building. It's very historic. We're very proud of it. Um, but it definitely has its limitations because of its age. So production often has to like scale for the size of our stages. Um, we do pretty much all, every kind of uh, genre of music. Um, so it's fun because we're never pigeonholed into one category. We um, get to do pretty much anything that you can think of, which makes Sam's job kind of a challenge because he's our marketing manager. So <laughs> I don't know if you have anything to add. <laughs> yeah, what's up guys? Uh, so yeah, I run all the social media and digital marketing spins for Foundation Presents, that being the social and the Beecham. Um, the difference in between the campaigns for the venues is that the Beecham, you're working with a little bit larger artists than the social in comparison, so they might have a little more content to give us to market with, because the unique position that I'm in is that instead of being like a club, for example, that like host our artists like as a club and that's our selling point tours come to town and then we host them instead so we're in a way limited to what content that the touring artists have to offer whereas in social they might not have a plethora of content so i have to be a little more creative with our marketing initiatives very good and actually while we're talking about marketing um do you have an agreement between artists as they're coming in to what that marketing might look like, how they're helping and what you, what the venues will be doing? Uh, yeah, for each and every campaign, we have like a tentative marketing plan. Uh, most of it in our age nowadays revolves around social media spend and uh, targeted digital ads and things like that. Um, so I'll send over uh, an initial plan to the artist team for approval and then if we need to make any adjustments moving through the campaign, then we'll do that for approval as well, depending on what they give me to market with. Very good, thanks. And um, Brian, with the different uh, you know, productions that you've been managing and been a part of, um, what, when it comes to the different venues, uh, can you explain the production process that you go through you know, coming into what would be more an, an intimate venue versus when you're looking at your stadium? tours yeah sure and it happens with every artist uh, the next tour uh, that I'm on we will be playing a market arenas and we do have a club date in there somewhere um, to be announced later but um, yeah we we have to scale on our end from our end from a standpoint we're already in the middle of a tour with 11 semis and now we're gonna go to a club and we're gonna scale that back obviously you can only fit so much into the box 
and uh, and to make it reasonable for everybody, you, you want to stay within those bounds. But you you just scale with what you do, and and everything that that uh, they had talked about with marketing and everything, it's the same thing on the on the larger scale that that we usually do. There's still a marketing plan that, and I I see the marketing that gets approved. Um, it's the same thing. We uh, like you said, we have we probably have a little more um, assets to offer for the for the marketing side, um, but it's the same process no matter the size really. It, it, it's the same process, just that it gets bigger or larger. Very good, thank you. And um, when we're looking at specifically the Beecham and the social, and you have acts that are coming in, do you ever have the opportunity to pair them with more local talent as openers or anything along those lines? And if so, how does that process generally work? Yeah, so um, we don't always get the opportunity to add a local talent because a lot of times national touring acts are touring with their own uh, support. Um, that said, we try to book as much local stuff as possible, especially in our smaller room, the social, which is definitely more of an intimate uh, experience. Um, and we also try to allow it to be like an incubator space for local talent to grow. Um, and network with other touring acts. So if they're not touring with um, support, then we try to put on a local, or if the show is not doing very well, we will push to put on a strong uh, local act. Very good, thank you. And then how, um, from the marketing side of things, how do you notice that most local folks in the area learn about your shows that are coming into the, that are coming in, or maybe the local acts who are booking? Um, since we're a variety music venue, a large push comes from the artist side itself. Um, there have been unique campaigns where the, an artist doesn't post about the tour a single time, and then the show sells out somehow, which, I mean, I like. But on the, the majority of the time, I would say 50% of the sales for a certain show comes from the artist side, and then it's up to us to try to fill up the other 50% with targeted ad spins, maybe a little boots on the ground marketing. We do like tabling at record store days and stuff like that at uh, local college canvases. And uh, yeah, just try to keep all of our paces covered. Yeah, all right. And then in exploring the website some and seeing the different acts that are coming in, I noticed that there's the Beecham, there's the social, there's also Hard Rocks mentioned in there. Um, Forgive me, I'm missing the other one. I'm House sorry. Blues. House of Blues, thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, Dr. Phillips was in there. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that they go to different ticketing websites. So how is that working when you have the different artists coming in, they're, you know, all of their ticketing is done a little differently? How does that work on your end? Um, so anything that's housed in our venues is hosted through the ticketing platform that we have a contract with. Um, anything that's, if we are promoting a show at a different venue, then it's hosted in their ticketing platform. Very good. And how does that impact, um, you know, your your end of the show, closing out your show, things along those lines? Um, as far as, so so we're not, whatever venue is hosting the show typically um, is going to be settling that show, mm -hmm. um, especially because when we're doing, uh, it's, we're doing co-pros basically, so we're co-promoting when we're at. House of Blues or Hard Rock, and so they're basically handling it all internally on their end, uh, and then anything on our side, then I'm settling it at our venues. Very good. All right, and I wanted to turn to the technical side a little bit here. Um, so at the um, at your venues, who's generally running the show? Does the band have access to the house? Is there someone they're generally working with? How does that process work? Yeah, so in our venues, um, we always have a house crew, so there's always gonna be someone running audio, running lights at our venue um, because we know the room and um, you know we're there to facilitate whatever the touring act needs. Um, most of the time, touring acts are gonna have their own crew uh, with them. Uh, not always though, sometimes they're gonna use our house crew, so it's you know, part of why it's important that we have them uh, available for them, um, but yeah. And, um and a question more so from, uh, you know, from the folks who are touring, from a venue perspective, what could make it easier to have an advance from the folks who are touring to make it a smooth process? Yeah, um, just as far, yeah, I mean, advancing is 
the most important thing uh, to do before a show. So I don't know how familiar anyone is with like the process, but you before you before Dave's show, you're going to advance the show. Um, so myself, the production manager of the venue, and the tour manager are going to meet over email and discuss basically uh, the expectations for the day, what everything that they're carrying as far as tech, um, what their what vehicles are traveling in, um, what the run a show schedule is going to be, just like. Basically, all the details leading to uh, that day, so that we're both, you know, going into and knowing what each other are um, anticipating, um, and then, you know, basically, the clearer that we can be in the advance, uh, the better the day is going to run. Because if you're, if I'm getting in advance like the day before, and they're kind of very vague about everything, it can be, you know, it's it's always better to be prepared going into a day with anything, I guess. That makes sense. <laughs> Very good. There's usually um, a, a tech pack involved yes. from the venue. Yeah. The, the venue, I mean, every venue should have a tech pack. And uh, for for us coming in as the visiting touring group, I mean, that is, that's vital to us. The more information, the better. Pictures are great. You know, we're trying to envision your venue off of whatever information you give us. So uh, whatever technical information is there, you know, from a technical side, where is power? How far away is it? Um, and wh where do certain things go? Um, you know, wh what, what seats can maybe be moved or not moved in the venue? Um, all of those uh, things are, are very important to us and try to make that the most clear day. And then back to your house crew, same thing, the, uh, having a great knowledgeable house crew um, is, is, is valuable. To give you an idea, when I walk into a venue, the first person I'm going to meet is a house person, a house representative, who's going to know what I need or can answer the questions of my needs. You know, remember, your house crew is very vital. How many shows a year do they do in that venue, and how many shows are you doing? I'm only going to do one, one show in that venue, most likely. That house crew has done 100, 200, who knows? So they really have a lot of vital information that can be passed on to make your day very easy. And in addition to the to the house crew and the venue, um, Brian, what are maybe some other teams that you're needing to work with when you're coming into a venue, especially if your show has you know pyrotechnics, if it has you know other other um, bells and whistles to it? Yeah, um, right. So we're we're gonna have if we have pyro, we're gonna need a fire marshal. You want to be very nice to him. He can, he can shut your show down in a hurry. Um, depending on what kind of effects you have, we may have gas. We may have CO2 um, that needs to be ordered. So hopefully the venue is, has relationships of where to order that from and to have it delivered. Um, you're probably going to want to eat at some point. So you hope the venue has a great relationship with some restaurants around uh, to be or with some great caterers. So you're really relying on. I mean, these these are the ba the back the local people are the backbone of of our of our day and what makes that easy or difficult and uh, uh, they're they're invaluable they're invaluable information for us from a touring standpoint. Very good, thank you. Uh, on the day of the on the day of an event, a load in day, you know, can you walk us through what that looks like from you know the moment somebody shows up, for example. Where do they even load in? Are they loading? Are they closing down that street and loading in from the front? Do you have back access to a loading dock? How does that process all work from, you know, getting that artist or group or groups um, mm -hmm. into the venue? Yeah. So at our venues, um, we have a back alley like loading area. So uh, the buses or you know bandwagons and trailers, they're all going to park back there. Um, parking can be one of my biggest headaches because downtown Orlando can be an absolute nightmare. And if they're traveling with two semis and three tour buses, it's, it's a struggle, but we get it done. Um, so yeah, they're all loading in through the back of the venue basically, and then straight to the stage. Um, so I'm, you know, once we get them parked up, uh, first thing I'm doing is going to meet their tour representative. Um, usually we'll do a quick walkthrough of uh, the space so that they get the lay of the land. Um, we kind of quickly run through what we've already discussed like via email or on the phone um, and just, you know, make sure that all of their needs are met. Um, 
you know, we're, we're hosting them, you know, so that's from, from every aspect, from like actual hospitality to our house crew to our security, like we are there to host the artists and host the patrons that are coming into the venue. Um, so that's, yeah, it's, it's very important that, you know, the relationship is built on trust. Right. If, if, you, if you've done a correct advance, then you've written the script for the day. I mean, by the time you get there, we should, you should be going through the things that you have already discussed if the proper advance has taken place. Now, that is a two-way relationship. That proper advance has to happen. One, the local, us, we have to reach out to the venue. The venues sometimes reach out to us. It is a struggle sometimes from a scheduling standpoint to get everybody on the same page, but it is necessity for it to happen. Um, and I, uh, I, I know where, where they are. You know, I'm trying to contact them and it's, hey, I'm in the middle of a load in. Um, can we do it this day? Um, no, I'm in the middle of a show that day and I'm in California. So there, there is a bit of a, a phone tag going on or email tag. But you have to stay on top of it because if it is done properly, it's just like reading a script come show day. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very nice. Um, are there certain days of the week when booking, for example, are there certain days of the week that you're really trying to book certain talent for a weekend, for example, or during a weekday? Um, how does that process work in working with the talent that maybe wants to come in versus talent that you'd like to be able to book during certain times of the week or even times of the year, to be honest? Yeah, so, I mean, obviously the weekend is always the best for any show. Um, that said, sometimes, it, you know, depending on the artist, it doesn't matter. I mean, we did Big Thief on a Monday and that sold out. So, it, you know, it definitely varies, but um, a lot of it has to do with, you know, routing and how the agent is routing their whole tour. And, you know, they're, they're reaching out to all the venues and getting uh, holds for dates and, you know, and then filling in um, what makes sense for, for the routing. So. Sometimes, yeah, we're, we're not going to get that Friday show because, you know, they're going to be in, in t Dallas on Friday, so we're going to get the Monday show or something. Got it. And for local talent who's interested in, you know, booking and, and you know, being in the venue, um, how are maybe some of those dates negotiated with them? Is it, how, do you, how do you do that? Yeah, that's definitely a lot easier because, you know, they're, they're not, uh, if they're not touring, they're... <laughs> you know, we can be more flexible with the dates. So, um, yeah, we kind of just figure out a date that we have available and a date that, you know, works around their schedule too and just kind of figure it out. Very good. And would the contracts typically, and this would even include marketing to some degree, would the contracts work differently if they say, I really want to be there on a Saturday? And you're like, well, it's, it's open, but it's a Saturday, you gotta pack my house, right. <laughs> you know? So how does, you know, how does that conversation, how does that negotiation or contracting work? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure it varies from venue to venue. I've only been at uh, these venues booking, so um, I mean, at least for us, it definitely can, dip, I mean, the contract might not vary, but it's more like who actually gets the date. So if I have like four holds on that date, and there's one artist I definitely want, and one I don't really give a shit about, like the one I want is gonna get that date. <laughs> yeah. Understood, understood. Makes sense. <laughs> um, has there been certain talent, you know, that unfortunately due to bookings, due, due to, I guess it could be a variety of variables of which you can fill in the blank for, um, where somebody wants to book and you have to turn them away and Catch us on the catch us on your way out of the state, or whatever this, or whatever the case might be. Has that happened? And if so, are you able to share any of those details? And um, you know, what's generally the resolution around that? Yeah, I mean, there can be a, a few reasons why maybe we don't get the show. Maybe someone else offered higher, and so they're obviously going to follow the money. Um, sometimes we we currently have some curfews on our night, so sometimes the artists don't want to deal with the curfew, so they're going to go elsewhere. Um, sometimes, again, just routing, they're like, we really want this date, and we're like, we already have it booked, we like can't, you know, and then they have to go elsewhere, so. That's too bad, you can't just catch them on the way back yeah. out. <laughs> catch us on the flip side <laughs> of things, right. perhaps. Um, uh, so, and Brian, I have a question for you, more so about kind of plotting and having, you know, how far in advance are you typically um, out on your tours from your venues to be able to have your full stage plot, um, assuming it, and this is an assumption, that from one venue to the next, while it might be the same show, 
there's still technical differences, um, you know, staffing differences maybe. How far in advance are you really plotting for each one of those as you're on a, moving along? Yeah, so we are starting our fall tour. We'll begin in um, October. And February, we were already sending out and dealing with cell maps. Um, so when we're in arena, we we send out a CAD of what our stage setup is gonna be. Um, and we lay that in over top inside the arena. Uh, we send that off to the venue. And you know we have a, in, in our stage, for example, we have a, a general mission pit area. And then behind that, we have seated area. There's <clears throat> numbers of how much you can fit into a general mission area. Some are five foot square per person, some are seven. So you're up against those, but you, you need to have all of that because in your ticketing platform, you have to build the manifest and you have to build the plan of how many can be uh, on sale so you can deal with that inventory. And you want every single seat that you can get, especially the ones that are close to the stage, that, that higher price point. So it's crucial for us to have that done. Uh, just for example, for my team, when we when we do that, it's it's myself, tour manager. We have our tour rigger um, because you know in an arena, if we move a stage four feet, that could save a whole bunch of time on rigging uh, for us and to make things easy, or it could make be able to get the lighting rig or video rig up higher where it needs to be. So moving four feet, well, that's an entire row of seats. So all of that is done that far out in advance, and we are hopefully going to have an on sale next month. But you know that's been a <clears throat> month long process to get. I think our fall tour is going to be 24 cities. So um, you know we have to do that process times 24, all at the same time. And the same thing we have to. We're dealing with the venue. We're dealing with what the fire marshal is allowing in a GA area. We're also mapping out what a 180 degree cell line is. Uh, what's the 270 cell line? So we want to be able to expand what we're doing. For example, for us, we, we have a VIP area in the, our front of house area. We kind of use it as a, as a flex area. If we're, if we're selling really well, we may give up that VIP area for our fans and put those on sale. But we build that, and when we place those seats in there, it's a production hold. So it's easy to release those seats. So there's all kinds of schemes going in to, to maximize the amount of seats being sold. Um, it's great to see an artist. This is a business. Um, the only way that an artist wants to return is by making money. Um, so that is, the, that is the main goal at the end of the day, to make it profitable for everyone uh, involved, including the local venue as well, or your local promoter. You want to make that sustainable for everyone. All right. Well, very good. Um, you mentioned one thing. You mentioned you mentioned CAD uh, CAD rendering. Um, would you mind explaining a little bit more about what that is? What um, in case anybody is unfamiliar with what a CAD yeah, rendering is? Um, CAD computer aided drawing, so um, mechanical drawing. But um, most all of your designers are going to be using a uh, software called VectorWorks. I know all the. Show Pro Kids are taught that on their end. Uh, AutoCAD is another one, but it is a two-scale drawing. You know of what uh, of what your arena is. Uh, we we deal with that on the front end when we're designing a show. What's the most popular obstacle for anybody on an arena floor in the U.S.? It's a hockey rink, so therefore you have a dasher wall. So now you got to fit everything within that area. Um, so you have limitations, and, and a CAD drawing is that. We, a venue will provide us with their CAD drawing so we know exactly where all their aisleways are, uh, where the open areas are, where we can rig, where their hockey rink lays. Um, every, every seating uh, setup is different, so we can see what their seats are, where seats retract, where seats don't retract. Um, so yeah, all of that information should be, is usually part of that tech pack that we mentioned earlier. Thank you. Um, and from, you know, from the Beecham and from the social perspective, um, you know, do you often have, you know, select standing areas, seating areas, VIP areas? How does that work in, you know, e even in these more intimate venues, how do you work that into your renderings for um, different acts that are coming in? 
Yeah, so for the um, Beecham, we have a balcony area um, and some like luxury box seats, so we're able to sell those like at a different ticket price. Um, the social's a lot smaller, a lot more intimate. We don't really have the option to um, scale it as much in different ways or see either venues really. Mm -hmm. um, so that one, we don't yeah do as much, but um, we do VIP meet greets in each room a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm, so. And in addition to um, maybe meet and greet areas or separate areas, um, from a merchandising perspective, um, are a lot of your artists coming in with merchandise? Yeah, pretty, I mean, nine times out of 10, yes. Yeah, <laughs> and how has that worked into your agreements with them when it comes to them wanting to sell? Is that part of, um, you know, are there fees associated with that? How, what is that usually, uh, how does that contracting work and is it consistent among um, artists or is there d differences between them? Yeah, it, it definitely varies. I mean, um, we take a small merch cut um, depending on the act, like if it's, a, if it's a merch type show, like Hunter Gex is like all merch. They're selling a crazy amount of merch. They're not drinking that much because they're mostly underage. So maybe our merch cut's gonna be a little bit higher there because we know we need to cover our costs in that way. Mm -hmm. um, Whereas other shows, um, we're gonna have like a lower merch cut and mm -hmm. you know, all those fees are just going to, you know, back right back into the venue to allow us to be open and pay our talent and pay staff and be able to keep doing shows basically. Right, yes, and actually you brought up a good point also, um, you know, referring to, to the bar, you know, when you do have, you know, a bar open, um, is that something, that's something actually that comes up frequently in, in, in my classes, you know, how does that agreement work? Does the venue keep the bar? Does that get split with the act? Do they keep the door sales? Do the door sales go to the act or mm -hmm. merchandise being part of that equation? So how do those, um, how does that generally work when they're, when you do know you're going to have, you know, it's over 21? Um, yeah, I mean, all, all contracts kind of vary per artist um, and I'm sure like per venue. Um, most of our, deals are um, guarantees, so we're going to guarantee an artist X amount of money versus X amount of the box office, mm -hmm. uh, whichever one is greater. Um, sometimes we'll do a door deal, which means you're just going to get a flat percentage of the door. Um, we always keep the bar, because again, that's kind of how we keep the lights on. Um, so it, yeah, it, it'll just depend on what kind of act is coming in. Got it. Very good. And um, Sam, I don't... Very quiet. So um, I wanted to ask you about social media. That had come up. So how are you managing those, the various platforms? I'm assuming that there are differences between the acts that are coming in and maybe where they tend to be followed more. So how, how do you keep up with all, all of those pieces um, in terms of your social media platforms? Um, well, if anyone's ever had experience with Meta Business Suite, which is the bane of my existence, <laughs> it's also the most useful tool currently in terms of productivity across multiple platforms. Uh, so a lot of my time is spent in the Meta Business Suite, posting on Facebook and Instagram, respectively. Uh, most link referrals come from Facebook across pretty much every single show campaign. So that, along with Instagram, those being connected within their like targeted ads and uh, ad spends and stuff like that, are top priority for us in the way that we run things. Uh, Twitter is okay as well. There are a lot of artists that have a predominant following on Twitter, so I'll, you know, in those show campaigns, I'll make sure to put a little bit more money behind that. Um, but across the board, it's basically just making sure that people are aware that the show is happening. So if anyone's unaware, the marketing is split up into three phases. So you have opening, maintenance, and closing. Most of the ad spend is spent in the opening, just so people you know, are aware that the tour is happening. And then along the maintenance, it's kind of, like we'll do like a few posts here and there, but it's kind of on the artist to give me like tour promo videos as the tour is progressing or as the tour approaches. And then we utilize those um, along the maintenance and then closing, we'll kind of put a little bit more money just to remind people that, hey, you know, next month, Here's the show that you've been looking forward to. Just make sure you have your ticket. Um, and there's ways that you can get a little bit more out of each of those phases. So if a 
if a show has, let's say, 200 tickets left to sell, you do like a low ticket warning and that kind of yields us a lot of tickets that we can kind of just get sold and then hopefully sell out the show before it even happens that day. Thank you. We're lucky that Sam's incredibly <laughs> analytical, but he also is incredibly uh, creative and so he, he also designs a lot of our artwork. Um, he designed this t-shirt. And he does, and he does, uh, you know, builds a lot of our, our show posters and our calendars. So there's a like, you know, marketing, a creative marketing side too that Sam, thank God, is so good at both of them. So, love you. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> um, very good. And from the staffing perspective, and I'm gonna, I'd like to toss this out to, to all of you. Um, from a staffing perspective, um, how, do you go about, you, how do you go about that process of you know, how, how many people you know that you're gonna need on a certain show day, um, you know, how their schedules might fluctuate frequently? Mm -hmm. um, and for you, it's the same thing. And, um, and something that I'm, I'm thinking you, you may be familiar with is when you're working in cities that require unions. Um, so how, how do you both do, manage those processes? Uh, for us, um, it depends on the, the, the way the tour is going to be. If it's a, a long tour where one of the large um, promoters like AEG or Live Nation is, has bought that tour, you know, they're going to be doing that advance. We tell them what we need. I see the, um, the predictions uh, the, of what they think budget's going to cost. Um, then we try to stay within those limits. Uh, sometimes we do have unions. Each union has their own different uh, style and different rules. Um, you have to kind of roll with it um, because you have to kind of think a little bit long term. From a from our standpoint, a touring standpoint, you know we we want to we want, we want to take care of the artists and try to keep costs down to a minimum as possible. But at the same time, we want to respect those union. Uh, laws or your your whatever labor laws are there because you have to remember you're from an artist standpoint you're coming back next year and they have a great memory of the ones who did not do them right um, not and if you did them great then uh, they're just happy to see you but um, so you have to keep that in mind you know, think think big picture down the road on that um, especially if you're with an artist that's emerging or just you know starting to bottle rocket up you know, keep that in mind, you're, you're coming back. Um, but when it comes to labor, um, you know, you, you, you do need it, um, but you have to want to be very cautious of that. So we, we send out our writer in a, in a way that we have certain scenarios like, you know, we'd like to have this many, but if the labor uh, union requires that we need to, then, then yeah, that's fine. <clears throat> we, um, certain scenarios, been on the venue, if it has loading docks, well, I'm gonna need less people, which is always a good thing. Um, so there's, there's a lot uh, of that to go in. There's also, then we get to building venue, for example. You know, I'm, I'm gonna want to have a certain amount of security involved, so I wanna make sure, one, there's enough security people. I wanna make sure I have security backstage in the right places. I wanna make sure I have enough security front of house. Um, and as far as when it comes to the house crew, I, it's really, at that, that, that point, that's up to the, the house of what, what they need. You know, I don't really know how many people they need to, to manage restrooms or to manage parking or to, manage ushers, you know, it's really up to them. Because and it also, in reality, those parts really don't affect my artists as long as there's enough to have it done efficiently and quickly. Uh, you know, there there is doors, you know, I want the doors to open, but I also want my artists on stage in one hour. So yeah, I want enough people there so that we can get in, because I want a full house when my artist starts. I don't want a uh, half house and I got another 5,000 people sitting outside trying to get through um, metal detectors, all right? So if that's gonna be an issue, then, hey, well, I'm gonna talk up front, you know, we need to make sure we can get through. And I'll, I'll ask the question, you know, we're gonna have this crowd come in, we're gonna have 10,000 people at this show, you know, is an hour doors enough time to get people cycled through? Again, you're back to your house crew. They've done that multiple times to say, yeah, we have a, a system in place that it does that very quickly and efficiently. Uh, the big thing for us was coming out of COVID, all right? so. Some people had to be tested. Some people had thermometer checks. I mean, it was just roll the dice. You didn't know what was going to happen every day. But again, you had to deal with it. And so that was that was a big question that's usually not so much now. But I had to make sure that, great, we need to make sure we have enough people that can get through the door in an efficient manner. Yeah. Um, I, I schedule staffing. You know, we have kind of like a template of what 
we're um, going to staff per show, but then that might vary depending on um, what they're advancing. So if they have like a really heavy production, then I'm probably going to add some more people, or if their production ends up being super light, I'm probably going to cut some hands. But it, same with security too. Like if we know ahead of time, I mean we know what kind of act is coming in. So if it's like a sold out, you know, heavy metal show, we're probably going to have extra security mm -hmm. um, because you know people are trying to have a good time, but they get a little rowdy. Um, you know, whereas if it's you know not selling well, or if it's like uh, Biba Doobie, like they're very you know they're teenage girls, they're pretty chill. I mean they're terrifying, but they're mostly chill. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, <laughs> and um, you know we're we're there to host. Uh, kind of piggybacking off what you said, we're we're there to host these touring acts, but it is our house, and we do you know expect to be respected. So if you know if if people start treating our people bad, like it's gonna be a bad day pretty quickly. So, right. and yeah, you're, you know, we remember that when you come back around. <laughs> right, I can imagine on both sides of yeah, that, that's definitely sure. mutual mm -hmm. or reciprocal, I should say, uh, relationship there. So um, kind of getting back to security a little bit, risk management, um, you know, uh, and I don't wanna get into too many details because that's part of risk management mm -hmm. is maintaining some of that. Um, but how has, you know, Foundation Presents, um, you know, responded to the need of additional security at downtown venues? And how does that impact um, artists who are coming in? How does that conversation, you know, how does that conversation flow to make sure that it's a, you know, it's a safe event and, mm -hmm. you know, like you said, here to have a good time, but right. keep the walls up. Yeah, so yep. safety's number one for us, and I know everybody hopefully agrees and says that at their venues. Um, I'm really proud that I, I walked into venues that are already, you know, sticklers about that, so they've always wanted everybody that comes in the building. Everyone gets searched when they come in. Um, everyone gets, like, metal detected wanted. Um, so the continuing educa education that we're doing, um, you know, speaks to that and we uh, so we have we hosted recently a like active shooter uh, seminar for all of our security which unfortunately we have to do um, but it is like invaluable knowledge just to you know make sure our security staff is really like on their toes looking out for uh, you know the people that we're in charge of when they're inside of our rooms um, and so you know we've done that for years and we're gonna continue to do that um, all of our security has to complete a 12-hour course before they can work with us. Um, so, you know, we will continue to do all of those things. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Uh, we, we call mm -hmm. that, uh, in our world, we call it risk mitigation, mm -hmm. and it extends beyond just the safety. Uh, we, when I, we have in the beginning of tour meeting, uh, risk mitigation is all the way down to what uh, our crew guys are and how they act. Because if I'm with Blake Shelton and I have a lighting guy who wants to start a fight with a security guard, they are never gonna remember that security, security guard's not gonna remember the lighting guy's name, he's gonna remember the guy from Blake Shelton. Uh, risk management goes beyond that. Um, when, when we are on site and we host a show, we are concerned with our people, we are also concerned with the patrons ourselves. Uh, some things that our production has done, we've, um, this year we've implemented a, a app and a, and a program called Weather Ops. So anytime we have a show, because we do outdoor shows, um, we have a service that any, any, any day we have a show, we have a meteorologist on, on call that we can call because um, I'm not a meteorologist. Um, I, I do lights and I do production management. Uh, my knowledge to the weather is, looks pretty bad. Um, so it's really nice to have, to have, be able to call that person and to have that, and we have the tools for us. Um, it, it's interesting, and when when we go around, I've, I've asked venues before, what's your protocol, you know, if we need to evacuate? And they, they have great protocols. I was like, okay, awesome, what's the protocol for everybody backstage? Uh, uh, oh, well, well, whatever you guys wanna do. I mean, I, I'm touring with 100 people. I have 100 people backstage that I gotta deal with. So I learned real quick, nobody has a plan for us, so we had to implement our own. And it's no fault to the venues because they don't know our needs, what we need every day. So, you know, we've, we've had to in include that into us. Same thing, we have our own active shooter protocols. So risk management, uh, you know, risk mitigation, it's, it's pretty broad spectrum what needs to be covered by that. Yeah, very good. 
um, and uh, such an important important topic. Thank you for addressing that. Uh, when you're looking at your the shows that you've been working on, uh, you know, when you have your your Blake Shelton's and more of your music focused, uh, you know, artists or they all are. Yeah. Right, they're artists, but <laughs> the um, but then you also have WWE and you have a few other shows. What are the, some of the bigger differences in production that you see between you know a musical, um, you know, show production versus you know um, you know a WWE, which is a completely different type of entertainment or right. Xfinity or these other shows that you've worked on? Yeah, I mean it's it's. They are vastly different, and you have to be able to uh, adjust for that vastly different. My, um, if you can imagine the, I know it's going to be hard to believe, but the demographic for a Blake Shelton show is vastly different from the demograph of a Neil Diamond show. Uh, for example, one of the issues we had on Neil Diamond in some venues was getting people out of the venue for loadouts. Why? We have a higher percentage of people in wheelchairs. It's an older crowd. Um, so you, you have to kind of plan for that. I do uh, television shows as well. And I've done television shows where we go into a small club. I mean, we're putting a lot of stuff in there. I mean, things that they maybe they haven't done before. But you know, again, it's all about that advance work. It's all about that phone call up front and to, to put out as many of those fires on the front end and also to prepare for them what's what's coming at them um you know information is key there's should be no secrets um i don't want to keep a secret that i'm going to set a ball of something on fire that's not a good thing to have as a surprise um, i also want to let security know that there's going to be co2 jets firing right behind their head you know when that's not coming it's quite a surprise to someone same thing with fire, you know, hey, there's gonna be fire in here. You want to tell everyone around you. So it's good to be very transparent with what's going to happen. Uh, I worked with an artist that liked to throw beer out in the audience. All right. Got to watch. There may be some underage people. So there's some things to go through that. I'm just saying but all that up front helps give that information up early. Yeah, we hosted Guar recently. Oh. Guar, yeah. That's yeah. exciting. <laughs> That's exciting. Um, are, well, then this might answer my question, actually. <laughs> are there certain things from the venue perspective when you read it, when you do have this advance and you're like, oh, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, what does that look like? Yeah. Um, you know, what are some of those things where you've just been, you know, sadly, you know, this was fun, fun to read, <laughs> but, you know, we, we can't really move forward with this as it is, yeah. how does that work? What are some of those things that you just can't um, or, uh, yeah? Yeah, I, the only thing we really say no to for sure is pyro um, because we are a 100 year old building and that would end pretty badly. Mm -hmm. um, so nothing, yeah, that has no like sparklers or like anything that has a fire element to it. Mm -hmm. um, but we do CO2 all the time. Um, besides that, the only thing we have to say no to is just like what our tech um, limits are so there's some stuff they're gonna bring in that we just like don't literally have the space for um, or the you know power capacity to host it so that's really like the only reason um, that we have to tell them to scale down got it and from a from a sponsor perspective or you know with touring artists you know how they're working with different brands for example has that ever posed an issue with coming into the venue or um, you know how does that often work uh, and I don't know if maybe you've run into this going into bigger venues or anything along those lines. Yeah, the biggest issue we have would be um, brand branding that's being signage that's going to be seen. Uh, for example, in a hockey rink, there's advertisement all the way around it. So a lot of venues, they just put black drapes over that uh, as a given. Uh, which, you know, if you have, for example, you have Michelob Ultra all around your hockey rink, and your artist is sponsored by Coors Light, and they're going to be doing a bunch of social media uh, for the for the show. Well, you necessarily may not want that to be seen when you're trying to advertise one, and the other one's bigger than than that. So, um, a lot of rings are now just just cover cover that thing up to kind of just make it a neutral a neutral area. 
Um, but I've never had an issue where whatever the venue was serving was ever an issue for us. Um, but usually that's, I've never even seen that come up for us. Yeah, we don't have Bud Light money, so we're not sponsored by that. Very good, <laughs> very good. And Sam, I don't know, does that come up from the marketing side? If you do have artists working with certain brands, um, you know, does that come up on your end at all? Not so much from the, from the artist side. There have been instances of me creating a design asset and maybe there's a logo in the background that we probably just don't even want in there, so I'll just Photoshop it out, but that's <coughs> the extent of what I have to deal with it. Got it. Very I do know there's some with, you. we mentioned House of Blues. Mm -hmm. Um, for example, let's say my artist wants to record that show. Mm -hmm. Well, now House of Blues is a very branded thing, and then all House of Blues have a beautiful House of Blues, you know, piece up Sage Center. So, you know, that's from the artist standpoint. Now the artist wants to record a show. Well, I may not be able to, or I may have to pay uh, another fee on top of that because now I'm including House of Blues into my possible commercialized video. So there is, it also goes both ways. Very good. Well, thank you so much. I think we're gonna open it up. Well, before we do that, can we just give a round of applause, please, to our guests? Very good. Very good. Thank you, they're all full sale grads. Proud, we're proud. So thank you, thank you all, all for coming. But um, we're gonna open it up to questions now. So anybody who has some questions, um, please raise your hand and we'll come around with a microphone. I know uh, your reputation as like an event promoter is probably one of your most valuable assets. So as like a startup event organizer and promoter, how, what are some ways you can build that reputation up? Um, I mean, you know, I'm sure everyone is sick of hearing it, but, you know, networking is everything. So start small, start doing, like, even how I've seen people start doing, like, house parties and then build up from there. Um, start meeting all of the venue owners or venue managers, operators um, that you, you know, want to be in good with and start talking about the stuff that you're doing and how you can, um, you know, what, what you're bringing to the table and what's unique about the kind of event that you want to do. Um, that would be my advice to start, is just start talking to people. You're in a room full of people who all have something in common. <laughs> Network with each other, most definitely. Um, I saw a few hands go up. Yes. And there's a microphone coming to you, just hang tight. Hi. Uh, speaking about COVID earlier, and this can go for everybody, but especially for like kind of smaller venues, what were some of the resolutions that you had to come up with during that time when there were limitations, lockdowns, so forth, to keep your institution going? And how have some of those practices stayed with you as lockdown and restrictions have lifted a bit? Mm -hmm. um, not to get too political. I guess um, we have a, a governor that didn't do much in Florida, so we it was illegal for us to actually have any kind of restrictions. So we couldn't enforce masks, we couldn't enforce um, vax cards or anything like that. So we lost some shows that way because we had artists who you know um, said they wouldn't play if we couldn't do it, and so. You know, our hands are tied basically in those situations. Um, but I mean, I would say we're more cleanly than we were maybe before <laughs> COVID. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, it was a challenge because, you know, we would, we would strongly encourage everybody to, you know, be vaccinated, wear a mask, but we couldn't, we really couldn't like actually legally do anything. So yeah, it sucked. <laughs> and I think right behind you, you can just pass that mic. Thank you. Um, so for local venues, how do you guys um, like market yourself for artists to want to come play at your venues? And for touring, how does the communication happen when you're trying to find a talent to work with? So I'll, um, on marketing of venues, um, there's, a, there's a great venue up in, uh, 
Connecticut. It's a small venue. It's not an enjoyable venue to, to load into. Um, but one thing that the venue has done when you're there, they take care of dinner and it's a massive seafood display and they have it, we, we call it it's like summer camp for roadies it's great there's bikes you can ride there's a pool over to the side there's a camp house but i i, I say that because the, the really the venue has taken what was necessarily not great for the, the scale of artists that they're coming in because we have to scale back our productions almost every time we go in there but everyone's excited to go we we can't wait and because this is a small venue now they'll bring in large artists who will now play their two three nights in a, in a, in a span so <clears throat> the, the the venues can do things to kind of make it an enjoyable spot for everybody to come i mean the artists we look forward to it man we can't wait to go there i mean it's Gil, guilford guilford connecticut i think where it is but it's great. We can't wait to go there. It's awesome. They have postcards we can send. We send postcards home to the kids. I mean, it's just it's just the whole vibe that they have created to 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 be there. So it's um, from from venue side, it, it it can be done. You know, um, it, there, there, there's way there's ways around to do that. <clears throat> and I mean, and if you have a great venue, everyone wants to return. I mean, it, you don't have to have a lazy river in your backyard or anything but it does help but uh but i mean great great staff Gr great staff is definitely uh a key to to wanting to return no matter where you are oh did you uh with the artists and stuff that you work with um like how does that usually look like do you do you meet the people at venues that you go to or is most of that communication online the communication as far as before we go to the venue? Is that what you're meaning? Oh, when I'm finding talent. Yeah. Um, so um, in, in my world, on my side, I'm, I'm a, a lot of times I'm a freelancer. So I'm taking jobs that are available uh, or artists that are looking. And it's a matter of shuffling positions around. There's been a lot of that going on lately. Um, so you kind of get hired on as, you know, as, as the job is needed. Um, it's strange for us. I don't send out resumes. I never updated a resume until pandemic because I needed a resume to be in the real world and, and do a real job, as um, people say. But um, it, it's it's all word of mouth and networking. So that's kind of how you get in. And then, I mean, the bonus is when you work with an artist that you have a relationship with. Um, it doesn't always happen. It, there's a reason it's called show business and not show friends. So. There is there is that that aspect involved to that. I don't know. If you all want to try it again, as as quick as you can go. Uh, you mentioned that you had to uh, deal with an audience like full of really uh, like seniors and dealing with wheelchairs. So I wanted to ask from an accessibility standpoint, mm -hmm. have you guys ever had to deal with um, getting a sign language interpreter for bands? Do bands offer their own sign language interpreters? Do you have to hire them? Or do bands outright say no interpreters? I don't want anything. Or has anyone in a band or performer been disabled and you've had to be creative which ha with how you need to accommodate them, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so our, our venues are ADA accessible and we often have people reach out um, to like reserve space for themselves. So we, we do that like, you know, not every show, but like most of our shows. We've only actually had, at least since I've been there, one person reach out about ASL. Um, so yeah, we, we definitely try to make our venues as you know accommodating to people as possible. And the um, ADA is Americans for Disabilities Act that was passed. Um, there has to be a percentage of ADA seats available of course, according to what you're selling. Um, so there, there's guidelines uh, installed in that. Same thing with ASL, it's really on a uh, request permit. Uh, from an artist standpoint, when, when we hear there's gonna be an, a an ASL, uh, it's, handy to have a light on them so you know we want to make sure that's that's available uh in the meantime we will also sometimes submit our set list uh so then uh so they can download lyrics so they understand kind of what's coming up to look at um so we, we want to be a pleasurable experience for for all patrons for sure mm -hmm. <clears throat> 
Um, so, Brian, I know you mentioned Live Nation earlier, and I wanted to ask, like, when a bigger company like that is running a tour, um, do they supply you with staff? Like, say, one of us worked for Live Nation, would they freelance us out to that tour, or would you have to um, ask for people to be supplied? You, usually they're going to give us one to two, usually two people. So we have someone who's going to deal with kind of the advancing of the building. And since they, the way that structure usually works, they buy the, inter, the entire tour. So the, uh, the show settlement happens through them. Um, so you have someone that's usually going to deal with the show settlement and then someone's going to deal with the production side and dealing with that advance. Um, you know, Live Nation and AEG both, you know, there, there's situations where they own the buildings as well. So that, uh, is really great. Um, the the advantage to that too, um, your Live Nation rep, again, is once they're finished with your tour, they're going to go do another tour. So again, kind of back to with the local local people, you know, you're dealing with people who's been there multiple times and has, and has done different things. Um, you know, they have certain local resources, um, doctors being one of them. That's pretty handy. You know, if you want something a little more in a medic clinic. Um, if your artist doesn't feel well, you definitely don't want to sit in the lobby of the medic clinic. You know, so you put out, it could be on Twitter before you know it. So, you know, having a doctor come to the venue, it's great. That's when we rely on the local people who have those connections already in line as well. <coughs> there's, there's one in the back and then two over here. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I have a couple questions, so it could be for any of you. Um, my thing is, with the tours that you have, um, are they pretty diverse, meaning the music genre, or do you try to stick with, like like she mentioned, I think metal, like metal, but you know how they have pop, and then they have the urban. Like, are you all pretty much open to a variety of different artists that can tour on your tour? Sorry, was that for me? Anybody, either one of you. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, we, we do like every genre pretty much. So, I mean, we had double shows last night. So we had a hip hop act in the social and we had a kind of emo alternative rock show in the beach room. Um, so we definitely don't really stray away from every, anything. We like to do everything. Okay. And kind of piggybacking off of what he asked, how do you all go about, um, how do the local venues here because uh, I didn't really get an understanding on the answer. Um, like, if you have an artist that, you know, they have a nice nice number on IG or they've already been doing tours or they've already been doing performances at different areas, whether in the U.S. or overseas, and what if they wanted to, you know, come here in the U.S. and do more um, in Florida? How do you all go about making it? Uh, making it easier for them to be presented to you all if if need be to be a part of the tour or whatever the case may be i would rely on the uh, promoters i imagine are coming to you the, approaching you the building yeah on the promoter side yeah yeah i mean <coughs> they're typically i mean if they're if they're trying to like route in a whole an entire tour they're probably going to reach out individually to each venue that they're trying to go to um so like being a part of you all's tour or oh, something uh, oh. you don't do. So do you mind if I, if I help? Ahead, okay. Um, so if I'm understanding correctly, um, they could be an, maybe an independent artist who's looking to get on the so-called ticket maybe of a bigger tour. Is that what, is that what you're asking? Okay. Um, I don't know the answer to that, <laughs> but I, I wanted to make sure that I clarified the question. So you, so you get the right answer or we can so, so Pitch any, that over. In any time you, any time an artist wants to book a show, they're going to have representation, and that representation is going to be a booking agent, and that booking agent is then going to work with promoters. So the booking agent says, "I, I want to get my artist here," and they're going to make the concessions, whatever it takes. Uh, but that's how they get on the bill. They may come in as the third act of four, uh, depending on the, the size of them, you know, and they may be there. Then next six months, another tour comes around, they say, hey, it worked out well, let's put you on as an opening act with another artist. Um, and you build your way up until they're either on the in the headline spot as well. But yeah, the booking agent is who does the booking for, for the artist. 
Got one more question for you guys, actually. Um, when it comes to, like, venue rental agreements, whether that's at a small local um, venue or even, like, stadiums, what are, like, the most commonly negotiated terms in those contracts? I would say, well, one, you got to get the show in. Um, again, back to that tech pack. If I have this fantastic set piece of Mount Rushmore that's part of my show, that's 25 feet tall, I can't get it fit through a 10-foot tall door. Uh, is that a showstopper? No, it's, so, I mean, a lot of that's negotiated. A lot of it's negotiated on how to get in there. From the money side, I don't really deal with that. Is that on your guys' end? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> typically we'll rent the room, so you're, you're gonna pay for staffing, you're gonna pay for us to open the doors and have the lights on. Um, so it's just basically, you know, it's kind of like a pass-through cost, like, of opening our doors for you. It's not cheap. <laughs> but it's worth it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Very good. I think this will be our last or final question for our session. Hello. Hello. Hey. So, Sam, this question is for you. Um, what has been the most effective marketing strategies that you've seen to get people in the door for smaller up and coming artists? Most of it revolves around how the artist is marketing themselves. So, since we're a variety venue, I'm not going to be a content manager for the artist. <laughs> you know, I, I have like a lot of other things to do, like across the marketing spectrum, and I don't really have time to, you know, create a whole tour promo for a certain artist. You know, individually, I will do like edited videos for like multi-event calendars and stuff like that. But as it relates to the artist, it's on them or their artist team to give me the things that they want the show to be promoted with. Uh, yeah, that, that kind of comes before the, the booking process. Um, say, let's just talk about like an individual show, for example. If someone is coming to either of the venues, I would recommend, of course, having the tour advertising materials. So that's like the tour poster. They could have like a couple tour promo videos. So you could either use those for like TikTok or Instagram reels or something like that, like short form video that advertises all the dates on the tour, or it could be localized for just our date. It could be something like a liner video, which is the artist, you know, shouting out the venue, like, yo, I'm coming to the social on this date. Tickets are moving fast, you know, make sure you buy yours. And it could be like a little more personal angle. Um, but yeah, basically it just depends on the artist doing a little bit more work because there is work to be done after you announce. And going back to what I mentioned earlier, is like a lot of artists don't have the luxury of having a huge fan base to where they post the tour ad map one time and then the show sells out that day. So it really relies on them and their team to kind of not do my job for me, but really give me the tools that I can implement with the analytics that I have available. Yeah, I mean, for example, we've got a hyper pop show that we're doing at the end of April that this local um, promoter uh, guy's putting on. And he's, I mean, he's like 19 years old and he's a hustler and he's, um, you know, he's doing the work essentially and giving us all of the content that we need to, um, to promote it. So, and he's, you know, really on top of his stuff. He's really, you know, good at communicating with us without being annoying. That's important. And, um, so yeah, I mean, that, that'll be hopefully a great event at the end of April. So April 27th. Do you, did you hear that? April 27th. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Well, thank you again. Thank all three of you for, um, for coming out and for your time today and for all that you do. Thank you. Thank you for moderating. <laughs>